Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our application boot camp. Um, this morning, you're going to hear from me. I'm Dave Harple, and you'll also hear from counselors Lori Ray Spring, Ellen Douglas Garrett, and Karen Kerr. So throughout this presentation, we'll uh, we'll talk about various aspects of the uh, college search and application process. We'll be discussing uh, timelines. We'll be discussing procedures, and we'll give you some insight as to how to uh, to manage the next couple of months as we move through the not only the summer but well into the fall, and uh, what seniors will need to do in order to support their their applications. Um, so that they can uh, successfully transition from Pencrest to the world beyond Pencrest. So welcome to everybody. And uh, this uh, presentation is being recorded. After the recording is completed, uh, we hope to have it published to our website uh, very shortly. So thanks to everybody for joining us on this kind of cloudy morning, but we hope we can brighten your day with this information. So let's begin. Um, today, we're going to talk about admissions. We'll give you an overview of that. We'll talk about um, the application instructions, and we'll demonstrate that uh, through Naviance, and we'll talk about Naviance and its interface with uh, Common App and why that uh, those two partner together to, uh, to support college applications. Talk about senior timeline. And uh, throughout this process, timeline is vital. Deadlines are meaningful. Um, I can't emphasize that enough um, in adhering to specific timelines and deadlines so that we can ensure the maximum potential for all of our students. We'll also talk about what uh, counselors and what Pencrest sends um, to colleges and universities in support of applications. We will also talk about uh, the Naviance interface with Common App and how Naviance supports applications and the college search process. We'll also go into financial aid, which is a key part of the, uh, the uh, college application process. And then uh, we'll wrap up with uh, some questions. So many thanks to all who have joined us and we hope that you find this information useful. Um, first of all, uh, as parents, we want you to be um, both directors or consultants at times. Uh, you might find yourself prodding your students to be uh, more uh, aware of timelines, or you might be just a listening ear um, to uh, to listen to your students as they share their thoughts and their their ideas as they move through this process. Um, I would encourage you um, to allow students to uh, experience all the all the emotions that come with this process. There is always some uncertainty that comes with it. You're sending your applications off and they're going to be evaluated by people you've never met. There is some natural fear and anxiety that accompanies this process. Um, and it's important to help students recognize that anxiety is part of this, but there are reasonable and well-supported ways to, to support it, including uh, your counselors, your parents, your teachers, um, your Pencrest administrators, we are all here to help you, to walk you through this process so that you can have a successful outcome. Give your students a chance to talk, to feel all of the range of emotions um, throughout this process. That's uh, very key. Um, and, and we find that this is very helpful in, in helping our students grow through this experience. Some general thinking points. Um, we want to help students find the right fit for colleges. Um, sometimes we get uh, caught up in thinking that uh, the right fit for us is the right fit for our students because I went to a certain school, maybe you should attend my alma mater. Um, we ask that we allow students to find their way, find the college that's a fit for them academically, find a college that's fit for them socially, find a fit that's um, athletically, if they're, if they're college athletes, in so many ways, fit is important understand the options that are available to students. We know that not all students are interested in going on to a four-year college immediately following high school, and some students are instead uh, pursuing a path of the community college and then transitioning to a four-year college. Some of our students are engaging a, a, a gap year, uh, and I like to call that a transition year, a bridge year, where we use that time meaningfully to explore the possibilities. Um, and understand that uh, you know applying to college and choosing a plan 
at this point in a, in a child's life can be can be stressful and that we can help manage that stress. And there is excitement and there is inspiration that follows all this. The inspiration that comes with uh, exploring a bold future and uh, stepping in to a world beyond high school. That's an exciting uh, prospect for all of our students. Um, there are many ways to support this process and we as counselors are, are of course a part of that, but we're not the only part of it. Um, certainly you can check in with College Board. College Board has a really nice piece called Big Future. And uh, I would encourage uh, parents and students to take a look at the College Board Big Future timeline. Um, we've included the link here, but you can also visit College Board and, uh, and view the College Board's uh, ideas about timeline for, for 12th grade, very useful tool. Um, at the outset, I talked about timeline and the importance of timeline. Everyone is on their own timeline, and I know that students shouldn't be pressured into looking over their shoulder and saying, well, my friend has applied to 20 colleges and I've only applied to five colleges, each according to their own. There are opportunities to explore a number of colleges um, throughout the fall and well into the winter. Uh, Pencrest welcomes college reps to our College and Career Counseling Center. Um, this year, we had over 160 different colleges and universities visit with us. Um, in addition, we had all the branches of the military um, visit us throughout the year to, uh, to share their options. There is also a virtual college fair coming up in, in September, and there's an in-person college fair in October. That's in Philadelphia. That's a rather large one. There is another college fair that will uh, be uh, possible for our students. That will be in the fall. That's at Penn State Brandywine. And I don't have that date yet, but we'll have that shortly. Um, and when that comes out, we'll, we'll publish that. In the future, there will be a senior parent night. That will be the um, generally the first full week of school. And that parent night will feature an overview of the college applications and admissions process, as well as an overview of financial aid and how financial aid works for students. Um, that will include uh, a look at the FAFSA, the free application for student aid. There will be some rather significant changes to the FAFSA this year. Um, the process is said to be simpler. Uh, fewer questions, and it should uh, streamline the process for, for all concerned. We also encourage our students to go out and visit college campuses. Getting those boots on the ground and walking through a campus is, is a very good experience. And I remind students that uh, this is an excused absence. We ask that you notify your grade level office in advance. There's a form available on the website. Uh, complete the form, submit it to your grade level office. Um, in this case, it would be Mr. Fuhrer's office for next year for our seniors and pay a visit to a college campus. Um, I will caution students that simply getting in your car and driving through a campus uh, does not uh, fulfill um, a true campus visit. I think it's helpful to pay a visit to the school, talk with students who are engaged in the school. If, uh, if you want to in advance, you can reach out to the school and see if they're willing to allow you to sit in on a class or visit with a professor from the chosen major um, for your students, um, but do this in advance. It's difficult to make those things happen uh, the day of a campus visit. So we'll talk about ways to apply to college. There are a number of different ways and uh, they're all intended to make the process easier and more user-friendly. The common application is perhaps the most widely known at this point, used by hundreds of different colleges and universities, followed by the coalition application, which is used by a number of um, growing number of students and universities. The institution applications are dwindling. There's fewer and fewer colleges that just rely on solely their um, institutional applications. We are seeing a rise in the self-reported applications. Uh, for example, Penn State, the University of Pittsburgh, Temple, and the University of South Carolina, just to name a few, because they're some of our most popular destination colleges for our students. These are schools where the student is able to apply as early as August 1st, and they don't require any support from Pencrest High School. 
um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, they rely on something called the self-reported academic record for students. And just as an aside, I would recommend that our seniors at this point uh, visit their hack, download a copy of their transcript so that you have that on file because those of you who are attending, intending to apply to a self-reported um, college or university will need to have that, that uh, transcript in front of you in order to complete the application process. If you're applying to a college and you're not applying early decision, you may have until May 1st of 2024 to respond to any college or university's invitation to attend. And I make sure that this is known to students so that you don't make any decisions simply because you receive a response. You have the opportunity to measure your applications, measure your, your admissions from various schools, um, evaluate programs, evaluate financial aid packages, um, really sit with your family and make the right choice. The only exception to this is if you apply through an early decision one or early decision two plan, and we'll talk about what those plans mean um, very shortly, but essentially these plans are binding. So you may only apply to one early decision school, and if you're accepted to that school, then you must um, agree to withdraw your applications from all other schools, and we'll talk about why a student would do that. Um, you are only um, expected to make a deposit to one school only. You may not make uh, two deposits to two different schools. That's a, an unethical pro, um, pro, um, process, uh, and as a NACAC member, a National Association of College and Admissions Counselors, I'm obligated to tell you that, so please don't do that. Um, be prepared. Um, colleges will uh, will have a number of different responses to your application. You may be admitted, you may be denied, you may be deferred, you may be waitlisted. Um, they may offer a summer admit or even a January admit. So these are all the different pathways that uh, that a uh, college may take with students. Um, if you're applying to different programs, we ask that students evaluate these programs and their special requirements carefully. If you're applying to nursing programs, many schools have very selective nursing programs. The seats are limited, and sometimes the timeline is different than in other programs. We also see this with uh, performing arts programs where auditions and portfolio uh, for artists, for musicians are required and the timelines and the deadlines and the expectations are different. Uh, some of the auditions are required in person. Some of the auditions may be recorded and submitted. For students submitting portfolios, uh, Mrs. Mattioni in our art department is very instrumental in helping students assemble those portfolios so that they can be submitted to college and colleges and universities and art schools for their review. So use all the resources available to you but be aware of the requirements for each of these programs. We have a number of different ways that I've referenced uh, about applying to college. And let me just review them um, very quickly. The one that comes up uh, more often than not, and I'll jump ahead, is the rolling admission. This is where once students submit all of their application materials required by the college or university, this includes a transcript, their application, um, if letters of recommendation are required, uh, anything like that, any additional supplemental essays, once all of those materials are received by the college or university, then that application is forwarded to the review committee for a decision, and that decision is issued usually in a fairly um, um, quick pattern. We see uh, students being admitted within a, a four to, to eight week um, decision after they've fully submitted um, rolling admission is especially helpful for students. We like to think of students submitting their applications anywhere from August through, let's say, early November to give them the best choices for their colleges. The next choice would be regular decision. Fewer and fewer schools are using regular decision. This is when students are required to submit all their materials by a specific date, and then they receive their decision by a clearly um, stated period of time. So some colleges will, will say, we want all of your applications by, let's say, January 15th. We will get back to you by March 15th. Um, 
fewer and fewer colleges are using regular decision. Let's move on and talk about early action. Early action is a very popular program, and each year we have uh, quite a few students who engage early action um, applications, and this means that uh, the students submit their applications by a designated deadline. And this is where deadlines truly matter. In most cases, the deadline is either November 1 or November 15, according to the school. Um, I will add that some of the, our Southern schools, uh, University of South Carolina, for instance, uh, uses an October 15th early action deadline. Uh, these deadlines are clear and well communicated by the schools. Um, it, let's use Penn State as another example. Penn State has a priority deadline each year by November 1. We find that students who apply after November 1 may um, experience rather significant difficulties and concerns um, gaining acceptance, especially to Penn State University Park. But with early action, uh, the decision is non-binding. So if the college returns with an affirmative and says, we invite you to attend our school next fall, it is non-binding. You have time to make up your mind and respond by the May 1st, um, 2024 deadline that I indicated earlier. Another program is early decision. Early decision is a binding commitment and you may only apply to one school early decision. And these are schools that tend to be highly selective, highly competitive. Uh, this would be a school that is your top notch, far and away, your um, moonshot school. And this would be a school where we know that there is an advantage to applying early decision. And I can use uh, an example. Uh, our nearest example would be like say the University of Pennsylvania. Um, students who apply to the University of Pennsylvania um, have enjoyed maybe a 20 to 22% acceptance rate depending on the program at Penn uh, when they apply early decision. When they apply regular decision, those numbers diminish to the single digits. You know, for some of the programs we see uh, eight to 6% acceptance rate. So there is an advantage to early decision. There are ways to take a look at the early decision numbers for various schools um, and they're out there. Um, not all colleges report them out, but uh, there are ways of, of finding out that information and we can help you, your counselors can help you with that. There's early decision two. Uh, we have a number of students who take advantage of early decision two. Uh, those deadlines are usually in early January um, we find that some students who are not admitted during early decision one might have a college warming up for early decision two, and that follows the same pattern, submit, and then um, the college can issue a response usually by March or April, and that decision is also binding for early decision two. And we can assist you with those um, applications. Talk about if early decision is right for you, um, early decision is not a decision to be taken lightly. Um, we, we like to think that you've carefully done your study, that you've researched the, uh, the program at the college of your choice very carefully, and you make sure that that is your chosen college. Make sure that it is a match, not only academically, geographically, socially, and make sure that your grades, your admission profile meets or exceeds the GPA requirements for that particular school. Pencrest does not rank students, um, but we do publish a school profile. Uh, Dr. Sweeney uh, puts together the, our profile and she'll develop a distribution of, of, of scores and show um, where students may fall within their class, but we do not rank students. Um, when students apply early decision, parents, students and counselors are required to sign an agreement indicating that if the students accepted, they agree to withdraw their applications from all other schools. Um, parents, you need to think carefully about this because there is a financial aid piece here. Um, there is no guarantee of financial aid um, and that should be understood from the outset with, uh, with colleges and universities where applying early decision. There are advantages. We've talked about the advantages of acceptance patterns. We know that the rate of acceptance during early decision tends to be higher than it is during regular decision. Um, 
that it gives students a, a leverage and opportunity to look for housing once they're accepted to college. And in some cases, it gives the students a chance to kind of reduce their stress. So they learn the, the response in December if they apply early decision in November. And uh, it, it certainly takes the, the weight off their shoulders for the remainder of their senior year. If they're not accepted, it gives students a, a chance to um, reassess options and look elsewhere. And as counselors, we work with students to, uh, to identify, you know, if you're applying early decision, where else will you apply? Um, it's the just in case model. You always have to think just in case. You know, what happens if I don't get accepted? What are my what are my options? How will I pursue those options? And are those options a viable outlet for me? Um, like I said, we'll uh, we'll share this this um, process out with you. Um, and there are distinctive differences between early early action, regular decision rates. Um, we like to see our our students apply early action. We think it get, does give students a distinctive advantage. When you apply early action, the pool of applicants is smaller. We find that applicants are accepted quicker. We find that uh, they're not compared to as many applicants at that point, and it gives them a chance to get into programs before the programs become scarce and seats in those programs become filled, and it becomes more challenging for you to gain access to a chosen college or university. Now we'll go on to uh, how do we apply to college? And I'll let my colleagues jump in on that process. Thanks, uh, Dave. Um, my name is Lori Rice Spring. I'm one of the school counselors here at Pencrest. Um, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is the interface and what uh, Naviance has to do with college applications. So your students have worked on Naviance since middle school. Um, and um, they've used this as a research tool, as a way to um, investigate career options, um, intended majors, um, pathways. Uh, so they're very familiar with the layout and the interface with Naviance and nothing really has changed. All of them will have, uh, have met with their uh, school counselor this year in their junior planning meeting. And in that junior planning meeting, one of the important things that we did was either review a college search that they conducted or conduct a college search through the meeting. And then we loaded those schools that they were interested in. And when I say schools, that could be uh, a technical school, that could be a career training school or two or four year college. So um, although not every student goes directly to college, um, the reason we need to concentrate a lot about the process for college applications now is because of the time sensitivity to that, but we all want to um, validate and uh, value all students' choices as they plan for life after high school. Um, so, uh, so those programs or schools or colleges that they put into their list are right now, you and you can access this information either through the student's Naviance account or through your parent Naviance account. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can email Mrs. Kraft or your school counselor, your, your child's school counselor, and we can make sure you get connected to your parent access of, this, of the Naviance account. But all of these programs are sitting right now in their colleges I'm thinking about list. And come September, we'll turn on permission for those to be to, for this final list of schools that they may be applying to to be shifted over to the colleges I'm applying to list and that has to happen because we submit documents electronically to these colleges so the school profile the college trans the high school transcript which Ms. Kerr will go over in a few minutes grade reports first second third marking period grade sometimes um, all the forms that either the coalition app or the common app requires that counselors and teachers fill out, all of that has to be done electronically. So all of those schools that students intend to apply to will be shifted over. It's very simple. It's a click of a button. Uh, we'll go over that. Um, Mr. Harpel, can you please go? Thank you. So this is where a student will be landing when they go on to their Naviance account. And you can see that there's colleges I'm thinking about and colleges I'm applying to. It's a very simple process. Um, we will be meeting with all seniors in a large group 
probably the first IE of the school year, which is the second full week of school. And in that, we all are there and we all go through step-by-step -step procedures. We <clears throat> give handouts, we show students all of the resources available in their Schoology course, which you also have access to. The Schoology course is really the direct line for all the information that students will need. We have tutorial videos, we have step-by-step -step slideshows for instructions to do anything that's required for the college application process. Once the Schoology courses roll over, in September, we will activate the, that course, just like a student has Schoology courses for all of their academic courses, they are all placed in a Schoology course for counseling by grade. Within that course, there is a ton of information. Um, so that will be very, really, very helpful, but we will sit with the kids, um, it, the students in that assembly and we'll go through all of these steps. And Mr. Harp will just change this slide to show where you would go into the colleges I'm thinking about list where their programs might be sitting right now. And literally it's indicate which college you are going to apply to by clicking the button to the left and you'll move the application list with a click of a button and those will be shifted over to the colleges I'm applying to. Next slide. And um, go ahead and do next slide. And then once that happens, they can also add new colleges to their list. Um, and then another important piece is um, something that counselors, we, we help students a lot throughout the year is details. So there are a lot of details involved in college applications. And it's very easy when you're nervous or you're rushed and you're just not used to this level of detail to miss things. And so we, we will absolutely gently remind them when we can't do something on our end, it's probably because they haven't finalized something that they need. And this is a perfect example of that. What one of the steps, and this is nothing that, this is all stuff that's gonna be easy for them to see, but it's just an important reminder. There are questions they have to answer. For example, um, how will I be applying to school? If you see on the screen, some of the schools, just to confuse us, just to keep us on our toes, will let us choose different types of applications. So for example, many, many schools use the common application, but just to make things interesting, some of them will also let you apply to their own institutional app. Two big examples of this are Penn State and Temple. Um, so they each have their own application. And so in this screen right here, the student needs to tell us which vehicle of application they're using. Are they using the Common App for that school or are they using the Institutional App for that school? And the reason is because we have different forms to fill out and the interface with the Common App is different. Um, so that's just an, one important step. Then at the bottom, they would add and request transcripts because that is an indicator that we need to send a transcript to the school. There will be additional documentation and a paper. So you should expect to see a form that you actually have to sign. We do need a signature for any students under 18 to, give, to grant us permission to send a transcript out of this building since that's a document that is a legal educational record. Um, and adding a little something here, also something new for next year is, we will be adding an additional statement on our transcript release form, which gives us permission, um, which, you, which you would grant permission for us to release documentation to the National Student Registry and the National Student Clearinghouse, which just helps us to track our alumni progress as they go through their um, post-secondary education. Um, next screen, please, Mr. Harpo. Mr. Harple, thank you. Okay, so I think this is gonna go on to uh, my colleague, Mrs. Douglas Garrett. Yes. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Helen Douglas Garrett, and I'm gonna take you through some um, slides focusing on the common application. So let me just get my view different, okay. Um, so the common application, some of you probably have already heard of it, if you're older students. Um, it is, I mean, I hate to be redundant, but it is pretty much the most common application that students will use. Um, as you can see on the slide, over 900 colleges and universities actually use the common application. Um, you might be saying, those not familiar, like, well, what is it? It's basically 
um, an application where students can add all the colleges, not all, but ones that use the Common App, all their colleges onto this one platform, this one site, and they can complete all the steps, all the things necessary to, to apply to their multiple colleges. Um, but you can see the last bullet does say not all students need to create a common application account. That's important because, um, and I'll talk about this a little more, but all colleges do not use the common application. So I repeat, not all colleges use the common application. Most, but not all. And there's still some highly competitive colleges that do not use the Common App. So um, just note that. And uh, what else? So to create the Common App, um, one of two ways to access it, you can go to your college's website and you will see a link for the Common Application on their website. That's also under the admissions page on each, like let's say your child's applying to Temple University. They go to Temple University's website they go to the admissions page, which they should do for each college they're applying to. Um, they will note under admissions what type of application, for example, Temple University uses. Um, Common App, they'll see. I think Temple may still use their school specific. Um, and then other schools might even have on their admissions page something called Coalition, which Mr. Harper mentioned. So most of our kids will opt to use the Common App um, and they must use their personal email only when creating their Common App account. I cannot stress that enough. Um, it seems like every year we still have a student make the mistake of using their school email. That email goes nowhere. It's only for Rotary Media School District um, communications. So they cannot use that email. They must use their personal email in order to create their common application account. Okay, so as far as the common app, some different areas and sections the student will see. Um, the first section is basically their personal demographic information, name, address, date of birth, so on. Um, they'll have an education section. They'll also have um, the section where they will begin adding their colleges. Um, there will be another slide, which I'll go into more detail about that. But um, basically, they want to make sure they are careful. Um, like Mrs. Rice may mentioned earlier, it is a very tedious process, but they want to take the time to go through and respond to the questions thoroughly and accurately. And the fourth bullet, the FERPA, that's the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And that's similar to your HIPAA, um, where your medical records are private. So this is where their educational records are private. So students will also have to complete what's called a FERPA waiver. And um, the question posed is, why should I waive my rights? Well, basically, when students are asking for recommendations, whether from a teacher or their school counselor, if, if necessary for that college, um, colleges expect that the recommenders were able to write a very candid assessment of that particular student. So, and they feel that, you know, we may not be able to do that if a student is going to be reading their letters of recommendation. So it's always recommended that students do indeed waive their rights to view their recommendations. Okay, next slide, Mr. Harper, please. So this is what you'll see when you log in successfully and create your Common App account. Um, you'll have all these different tabs on here. This student already has added Lehigh University to her particular common application platform. And um, you'll have a common app tab. The common app tab is where you'll answer all any and all questions like that demographic, that educational section. And that, that information under the common app tab will go to all the colleges, every single co college that is listed under your My Colleges tab. So in this case, Lehigh University, you can also see the different sections that the student will have, to, that you, the student, will have to respond to under Lehigh University. Um, and then in the body of this, you can see all the contact information for Lehigh University, the application deadlines. Um, typically, you'll see in here with how many, if you need a teacher letter, how many teacher letters, if a counselor is required, you'll see all that information in the body when you open up your tab for the particular college. Um, keep in mind, though, I always tell students, don't just only rely on this information in Common App, 
Again, as I mentioned earlier, you want to spend time on Lehigh University's admissions page to get more specific detail about all the different requirements to make the application complete. Next, please. Okay, so the Common App FERPA waiver, I uh, uh, mentioned this earlier, within the Common Application under the Common App tab is where you will see that section for FERPA. I think I have a, um, yeah, I think we go, we have a slide later on. So um, I guess you can read this to yourself, but basically in order to sign off on it, you're gonna go into your Common App tab and you will see a section that says FERPA. Um, it's it's there, it's plain in sight, you won't miss it. Um, go to the colleges that will, okay. All right, so next slide. So under education, this is where I mentioned earlier, you just wanna be very thorough with all the information you're, you're completing. And anytime you have questions about things, always seek out your school counselor. You know, basically some students, some students need more help than others. If you are struggling completing information, definitely come see us. But again, this is something you'll see when you're working on the Common App. Next, please. Okay, so as I mentioned before, you will be adding any colleges that you're applying to that use the Common Application. You will have to add them one by one into your My Colleges on your Common Application. So you go in here and you search the name, you type the school name in, and you just have to be very careful. It sounds like a very easy task, but you just wanna make sure once you search for the name that that is the exact college that you want. So you wanna check out the, the city, the state, um, because for example, if you think you're applying to the Ivy League Cornell, you wanna make sure you put Cornell University, that's in New York, and not Cornell College, that's in Iowa. So you wanna double check, make sure you've selected and found the correct school before adding it to your My Colleges list. Okay, so again, you can see under this particular college, Mount Holyoke, you can see the questions for that particular college. Once you click into that section, questions, all the different questions will be in the body. And same for the FERPA, recommenders and FERPA section. You click on that tab when you're ready to get to that and all the information will be in the center body of the particular tab. And you will go through all the steps to answer the questions required to complete the FERPA. Uh, once you're done each section, so once you're, you've completed all the questions for that particular Mount Holyoke College, um, a green check mark will appear. Same for the FERPA. Once you've successfully responded to all the necessary questions, again, you'll see green check marks. So that way to help gauge, you know, to make sure you did not leave something unanswered. Next, please. Okay, so this is the FERPA release section. And I mean, it's very self-explanatory. So you just wanna read through everything carefully because you do wanna understand what you're signing off on as far as the FERPA release. Okay, and um, so again, here's another another um, section. It, it's going to take you through like a couple different sections to get through all the FERPA waiver information, and this is one of them. And this is where it's also you want to make sure you check off that you truly understand what you're signing, um, you understand what the FERPA release authorization is, and then you'll go to the next slide, Mr. Harpo. Um, so once you've done all this FERPA that you need to do, you're going to then go back to your Naviance account. So again, just a reminder, you're gonna complete your applications either on the school specific application from your university's website, or you're gonna use the Common App. Naviance is not where you complete your college applications. It's just where we kind of hold your letters recommendation, where we send your transcripts out, um, and where now you have to match your Naviance account to your Common App account so they can communicate with each other. And so basically Naviance allows us to have a portal so that we can send transcripts, we can send letters of recommendation through to the Common App and then from there to your colleges. So this step is necessary. 
once you've gone through that FERPA, you're going to go to Naviance, log, make sure you're probably already logged in or log in. And um, Mrs. Rice being mentioned or Mr. Harple, the I'm thinking of section. Well, now you want to definitely make sure you're in the I'm applying to section. So you'll click on there. And then the next step, you'll see the next screen. It'll say click. Oh, no, no, no. Go back. It'll say click match accounts and you'll see this red bar. This is towards the bottom of, the, of your slide. You'll see this red bar and then the arrows pointing to exactly what you wanna click on. It'll say match accounts. So you wanna make sure you go through those steps so that you can have your Naviance communicate with your Common App account. If you don't do this step and you're using the Common App to apply to your colleges, we cannot send out a transcript we cannot send out a council letter if it's required for your, your particular colleges, nor will teacher letters be able to get submitted. So this is absolutely necessary. Um, and as Mrs. Reisman mentioned, there is a video on how to do the matching on Schoology. Okay, next, please. Um, so from there, once you click that match, it's gonna redirect you to go back to your common application, common application. And this is what you will see, log into your common app account and you'll have to go ahead again and put your email and password in. Um, and then you'll see this slide below telling you basically you have another. So it's all these like check, 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 next, next, now. So you just basically have to follow the sequence and all the steps. It doesn't take long. It may seem like it, but it really does not take long. It takes like, a few minutes to go through these steps. Next, um, and then on your common application, you'll finish out the FERPA release um, and you'll go through all these different read throughs. So please, sometimes I have students sit next to me and they're just like click, click, clicking. And I'm like, no, 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 let's go back and read. Make sure you understand, you know, what you're signing. I mean, what you're checking off and what you're signing and agreeing to. So make sure you read it so you truly do understand. And next, okay, that's it for me. I believe Ms. Kerr is up. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yes, lots of details like Ms. Rice Spring talked about earlier um, in the process. Um, next year, we are going to have a career and college counselor that can help with this as well that will be holding uh, application workshops during IE so students can get additional help during that time and not have to miss class. So it seems a bit overwhelming, but um, it really isn't once you get started in the process. So the next thing that we're going to talk about are teachers' letters of recommendation. Not all colleges require teachers' letters. Um, some do, some only require one, some won't take any at all, like uh, University of Pittsburgh. On the college's website, they'll let the students know if they are requiring a letter or if the students should submit a letter. Um, if the student hasn't talked to a teacher um, to get a letter if it's needed, they should do that once school starts and allow the teachers at least 14 days to get those letters um, submitted to uh, the colleges. The teachers will submit the letters through Naviance. So another step is that the students will need to go into their Naviance account and add um, the teachers' names so they're able to send the letters. Then once they add the teachers' names, they can select which schools they want that letter to go to. Um, if they have a school that um, takes more than one letter and they've asked for two teachers to write letters, um, then they can click all schools and both letters will go to all schools. But some schools will only accept one letter. Uh, for example, Temple will only take one letter. So they'll have to choose which teacher that they want um, Temple's that, which teacher they want sent to Temple. So they'll either click all schools or select each schools individually for each teacher. Um, you do not add the teachers in Common App. You will only add the teachers' names in Naviance. Um, and Naviance will be how 
the teacher's recommendations get to the colleges as well as how transcripts get to the colleges. All right, next slide, Ms. Tarpel. Um, it was mentioned before that SRAR, which is a self-reported academic record, more schools are starting to use this. Um, right now, it seems to be the bigger state schools, but a few other of those bigger state schools have started to pick it up. Basically, it means they don't want a transcript from us. The student would need to complete the um, SRAR. Dave. Okay, so um, as I said, some of the bigger schools use it. Penn State uses it. Pittsburgh uses it. Temple uses it. University of Delaware is one that has been added on to use it. So <clears throat> the student's application is not considered complete until the SRAR is done, but they cannot complete the SRAR until they have submitted their application to the college. So for example, Penn State, they can um, use the Common App for Penn State, submit the application, then Penn State will send them an email and that Penn State sends it fairly quickly which within a day or two. So once your student has submitted their application, they should always begin to check their emails. Um, different schools want the SRAR done different ways. Penn State and Pitt want it done on the SRAR website so they, in their email will say go to the, they'll have the link go to the SRA website create an account and complete it on the SRAR website and then they um, push themselves into the students SRAR and the student would uh, check off Penn State and Pitt and then submit the SRAR to those schools and then their application will be considered complete. Temple likes it completed through their portal so you have to create a Temple portal first, which that information is sent to the schools, uh, to the student through the email. Um, they have to have a uh, code to create a portal. And once in the portal, they complete their SRAR. So it's important <clears throat> to check the school's website, see if they want the SRAR. And then once the application is submitted, that they check their emails to see how that SRAR should be completed for that school. Okay. All right, so timeline. So we do get a lot of applications in the fall. So we do need about 15 days to process that application. Um, we need to do work in Naviance. Sometimes we need to write a letter of recommendation. Not all schools want a letter from the counselor, but um, if the school does, we need to get that done. So um, it is important to pay attention to deadlines, probably. One of the first deadlines a student would encounter is the November 1st early action or October 15th early action if it's a Southern school. So they need to make sure they have all their information in Naviance and they have completed um, the release form to allow us to send um, information to colleges and have met with us if they're requiring a letter of recommendation at least 15 or two weeks in advance, like a 14 day window. Okay, Mr. Harpel. All right, so who sends what? The student is responsible for the application. So that would be either through the Common App or using the institution's application, um, which does have to get noted in Naviance which way they've applied. So we don't do anything with the applications as far as uh, getting them sent. The student does that on their own. The student also needs to send their ACT or SAT scores directly from College Board for SAT or the ACT website. So they would go into their accounts on those website, um, link SA, uh, click SATs, get to their scores, and they'll see a link that says um, send score reports and then they can decide exactly which scores they want to send and uh, which colleges they want to send scores to. Um, quite a few schools have continued with SAT or ACT optional, so not um, all students need to send scores. Um, they can look on the college's website to see if they've continued to be an optional school. Um, teachers will send their letters of recommendation through Naviance. So teachers have access 
to Naviance. They will upload their letters into Naviance and then send their letters when they're complete to the uh, students' colleges. Right, Ms. Tarpel. Um, what we send as counselors, we will send the transcript if it's not an SRA, our school. If it is an SRA, our school, we will send a final transcript to that school if the student decides to go um, to accept their acceptance. So then, then the school will compare what the student recorded in the SRAR and what the final transcript says. Um, we can also send first quarter grades. Students need to request this. Um, and they're typically available, I think that should be the first week of December because first quarter is not over till November 21st usually. Um, and then we can also send uh, first semester grades. It's the mid-year report, which quite a few schools do like to see. Um, so after the semester ends, we would send that report. Again, the student needs to request that through us. Um, the Common App Secondary School Report, students might come across this as a requirement on the um, admissions page of their college. That is automatically sent um, if the student's using the Common App. Um, we'll send Pencrest's profile, which I'll we'll have a page that shows what that looks like, and the recommendation if it's required by the, the college. Not all colleges require recommendations letters from us. Um, all right, next page, Mr. All right, so this is the profile. This is what is sent to all of the colleges. It includes information about our grading system, how different levels are weighted. Um, it includes um, the classes that we offer, the AP classes, accelerated honors classes. Whoop, not so quick, but that's okay. So it gives um, the college a a profile of what we offer and our academic rigor um, that the student has completed. Okay, now we'll start. This is the transcript. So the transcript will include all final grades only of the student um, for each year. Under each um, year, it will include their cumulative GPA and their current GPA. So colleges, when you're reporting GPA, want your cumulative GPA. So in 11, you'll re, be reporting your cumulative GPA from 11th grade year. Um, and that is posted on the transcript. It has unweighted and weighted. Typically students report their unweighted GPA. And then um, when they're reporting that, the application will ask, is this weighted or unweighted? Um, but they will see both the GPAs for each student, the weighted and unweighted. So this is what first marking period grades would look like. It is basically your report card. So all of the grades are posted and then we send um, first marking period grades. If a student did well first marking period, we should definitely send their grades, whether the school is asking for it or not. Um, and then again, they need to request that. So we are able to know they want them sent, okay. And then this is what semester grades will look like. So not only is first marking period and second marking period included on there, but the final, I mean, the midterm exam would be included on there. And for some semesterized classes, the final grade would be completed, completed on there. So um, that is all the information that's sent. More schools are requesting these midterm reports. So it is important to do well senior year so we can send a good report. And again, even if the school is not asking for it and the student's done well, we should, we should send these mid-year reports. All right, next. Okay, I think this is Mrs. Wright Spring. Yes, it's me. Thanks, Karen. So, um, Okay, so there are some of our students who are uh, interested in continuing to uh, participate in athletics in college. 
Um, some students are recruited by different coaches at different levels. There's divisions one, two, and three. Um, only students who are planning to participate at the division one or two level have to register with the NCAA Eligibility Center. Um, there is a ton of information that is easy to find by Googling, but there's also a whole folder in our courses on Schoology, which are inactive right now because you know, everything's sort of quiet on the Schoology front, but once those are activated again in uh, late August, early September, we'll have an entire folder with step-by-step -step instructions and video tutorials on what a student must do um, in order to register with the NCAA Eligibility Center. Um, next slide, please. So um, students can really register anytime. Um, so I have soft, we have sophomores that are registered. Um, at the end of every year, um, it's our job to send uh, final transcripts to NCAA um, for them to double check and um, recalculate grade point average based on the core courses only and uh, make sure that students are taking courses that fit the guidelines. Um, all of our students, uh, core courses for NCAA are all our four core primary courses of English, social studies, math, science, and world language. So NCAA requires 16 core courses um, and they recalculate a student's GPA. So if a student has a bunch of really solid, you know, high grades in their um, elective courses like band or art or technology, um, that could inflate their overall grade point average. So just keep in mind that a student who has a GPA here uh, at this school does it not necessarily mean that it's going to be the same uh, GPA that the NCAA calculates because, of, of course, they have to take out everything but the core courses. There are some really, really wonderful worksheets that are accessed. They're easy to find just by doing an internet search, but we'll also have them uh, contained in our course on Schoology. Um, where there's actually a fillable PDF that will, instead of, uh, I used to have to hand calculate these GPAs and courses. Now it's all calculated when you complete the coursework on the um, worksheet. So it's really helpful. So if your, your student is considering an athletic career in college and you're not sure what they need to do, have them make an appointment uh, with their school counselor and we can walk them through the process. We can share links home to you and to your student with the links for these worksheets, which are really useful, um, sort of walk the student through the timeline. Every sport has its own sort of blackout dates and active dates and who can talk to what coach, what time. Um, and that's all spelled out really easily on the website. So that's really useful information. Next slide, please. Um, right, so there are there's a link here, and um, all of this information is going to be accessed through this PowerPoint. But also, again, once the course opens up again, up again in Schoology, you'll be able to access all of this information. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Harpel. Some uh, closing thoughts about the uh, the college process. We've emphasized the importance of uh, timeline and deadlines. We've also emphasized the importance of utilizing your resources. Use your counselors, use your teachers, use your administrators, use your parents. And uh, Mrs. Ms. Kerr referenced that uh, beginning in the fall, we will have a uh, full-time college and career counselor on board with us. Um, so that will be an additional resource for our seniors. Um, to use throughout this process. That person will be uh, helping to schedule our college rep visits. That person will be working with students on their college applications. So there will be all sorts of support offered um, here at Pencrest to make sure that our students um, have the maximum um, support that they need to, to be successful. Mr. Harpel, I think you're one ahead on the slide. You're on the financial aid slide and not the closing thoughts on college application slide. Yeah, for some reason I can't go back. Okay. There it is. There it is. There it is. It was stuck. Um, so we've talked about uh, the application process, and I will mention this. This piece comes up every year um, where students submit their common app piece or they wait until they, they say, 
well, I'm waiting for um, my teacher to submit their letter of recommendation, or I'm waiting for my counselor to submit their piece. Um, I will say this, all of these pieces, the student application piece, the letters of recommendation, all of these pieces travel separately. So students, go ahead and do your part and count on your counselors and everybody else to do their part. All of the pieces will assemble at the college and university's website. They'll create an electronic file for you, but do not wait. Go ahead and submit. Do not wait for your counselor or for your teacher to submit their materials. All of those will, will reach their designated point at the right time. Can't emphasize enough uh, communication. Notify us when you submit an application, even if it's a self-reported application, so that we can uh, be aware of it and support you through that. Uh, Mrs. Rice Spring just detailed the uh, the NCAA clearinghouse piece and talked about the specifics for um, taking a look at your core courses and your core GPA that's required to be a Division I or Division II athlete. Understand your deadlines, especially for um, schools like Penn State, um, Pittsburgh, all these schools that have designated deadlines. I can't emphasize that enough. We also remind students to check your email. Check your school email from messages from Pencrest High School, from your counselors, and your personal email from messages from colleges. So often students miss messages from their colleges, and then the colleges reach out directly to us, and then we have to go back to the students, so that prolongs the process and may uh, may help the, uh, the student along the way if, if they just take a look at your um, your email. And I know I hear from students all the time that, oh, I don't check my email. Colleges will communicate through your email. So please make it a point to, to check your personal email, check your school email on a routine basis. Financial aid night. Um, in the uh, future, we'll have a senior parent night. I mentioned that at the outset of this presentation. And in that senior parent night, uh, Mrs. Rice Spring will talk about uh, the details for processing your application, the procedures that will support your, your application, and we'll also have a financial aid piece where we talk about applying for the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. That's one component that is very um, important to the financial aid process. It will enable your colleges and universities to determine the, the amount and type of financial aid they can offer whether it be scholarships, grants and aid, work study, what have you, but the, the FAFSA is absolutely critical. Um, one point that I'll mention about the FAFSA, sometimes parents will say, um, our family earns far too much to be considered for financial aid, uh, therefore we will not complete the FAFSA. Um, what happens at many colleges and universities, if the, uh, if the family does not complete the FAFSA, then the college and university will be hesitant to dip into their own pockets to offer financial aid. The FAFSA only takes a few minutes to complete. It's uh, not a labor intensive form. Um, so I would recommend that, that all parents uh, consider completing that uh, FAFSA. Coll um, private colleges and universities will also use another financial aid tool. And parents, as your students are looking at the students uh, admissions page and applications page. Parents, you should be looking at the financial aid page and understanding what your responsibilities are for um, completing the uh, financial aid requirements for any college or university. This is absolutely critical. Uh, deadlines are specific and they are enforced by these schools. All colleges are required to have a net price calculator um, to help families better understand their financial obligations for each college and universities. Uh, sometimes we, we focus merely on tuition. And we neglect to understand the other components of sending us to a student to college, uh, the cost for room and board, the co cost for various fees uh, to support a student in their first year, especially of college. So parents, take a look at these, um, these points and use that net price calculator when making your decisions about uh, colleges and their admissions. You may go into Naviance, and Naviance also has a cost and aid component in it. 
Um, I would also uh, urge all parents to visit each college's admissions website and take a look at their um, cost calculator. It is a tool that's now required under federal law, and uh, I find it very useful to help students as students become more aware of their financial obligations as they move through college. As we know, student loan debt outweighs all debt in this country, including home mortgage debt, it, uh, well, it is credit debt. Um, it is a leading cause of concern for our students. So we want our students to be financially aware of their decisions and uh, the, uh, the points that they need to think about as they move forward into their uh, world beyond Pencrest. Talk about the FAFSA. And uh, we'll go over the FAFSA more at, at our financial aid night, but students and parents will need to create an FSA ID. The FSA ID is a PIN number that will serve as the students and the parents' electronic signature for uh, the FAFSA as they move through all years of college. So once you create it once, that will be your FSA ID for all of your years in college as you access federal aid. Um, the FAFSA website is very useful. I recommend that students and parents take a look at the FAFSA. This is fafsa.gov. Um, make sure you access fafsa.gov. When you query FAFSA, you may come across fafsa.com. Keep in mind that FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. No student or parent should be required to pay any fee to access FAFSA. Uh, parents you may be inundated with requests from various services that they can help you to pay, um, help you to uh, fill out the FAFSA. The FAFSA is a free service. I mentioned a few moments ago about uh, colleges and universities, mostly private schools that use something called the CSS profile. This is another financial aid tool that schools will use in, in addition to the FAFSA. The CSS is administered by College Board. Um, you would need to um, create that profile through College Board. There is a fee, unlike um, FAFSA, there is a fee for the uh, CSS profile. The CSS profile is more labor intensive. It asks more questions about your financial background and what you'll need to supply to the schools to help them make a decision about their, their federal aid. Um, it is absolutely vital, parents, to keep an eye on this, especially if your students are applying to a private school. Many private schools will use this tool, and many private schools have very distinct and enforceable deadlines for parents to complete these, these documents. Finally, um, you need to prioritize your, your needs and your goals throughout this process. There will be different priorities at different points. There will be different needs at different points. Sometimes the need is just to hear, be heard. Sometimes the need is just to offer support and understanding and understand your goals for, for this process. Use your time wisely. The summertime is a great time to maximize your time. Um, you can begin by creating your Common App account at this point, um, taking a look at the Common App um, essay prompts. Now is the time to begin working on that. August 1st is when the window um, opens for applications. Um, so here we are, June 21st. You can begin creating the body of your Common App account now. When August 1st hits, you can start applying to schools like Penn State, Pittsburgh, Temple. Uh, they're all um, self-reported academic record schools. We've had many students who've applied to those schools in August and then uh, earn acceptance as early as late September, early October. Um, we ask that students stay organized, stay organized with your time, with your materials, with your resources. Don't be afraid to reach out to your counselors, your teachers, and even admissions offices for help. Um, parents, this is an opportunity for your a teachable moment for your students. If they have a question specific to the college or university, encourage them to reach out to the individual college admissions office. In many of these offices, there is a there is a college application officer, admissions officer who is designated for uh, a specific area, for example, Delaware County, Chester County, and so forth, and that will be designated on the admissions website. Have your student reach out to that admissions officer with their question. Um, students 
self-advocacy matters. Uh, colleges like to hear directly from students. They see that as a, uh, as a sign of maturity, uh, a sign of um, self-advocacy, and they enjoy hearing directly from students. So we've talked a lot this morning, and you've heard a lot, and uh, um, we're so glad that, uh, that you've joined us this morning. We hope that you found this information useful, and uh, we'll be publishing this uh, presentation to the website. And I'll remind everybody that there will be another um, college application boot camp in August. And then, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there will be a senior parent night at the outset of, uh, of the next school year. So many thanks to everybody who joined us this morning. Um, have a safe and happy summer. We wish you the very best. Thank you.